That song, that song is such a powerful song. The lyrics reflecting scripture and the truth of God's promise that he promises to hold on to you despite whatever comes our way in this life. And how apt for our passage this morning and our subject matter. See, over a year and a half ago, I was sitting in an eye exam in a doctor's office. I had waited three hours for the moment when the doctor came in very abruptly to tell me that I had glaucoma in both eyes. And then he left. And I had no clue what that meant. I just remember being shocked from having waited that long for such a, you know, a bombshell to be dropped and him leave. And I remember turning to the nurse and asked, so, so what can we do? And she looked me in the eyes and said, sweetie, there's nothing you can do. You can't get rid of it. And she went on to talk about some kind of, you know, eye drops and other procedures. But at that point, I had, I had stopped listening because all I could, could think about was the permanent eye damage that I'd already uh, sustained in my right eye and how they were saying that it was going to get worse and that there was no cure for that. And so as I walked out to my car, I was just in this moment where there was just this weight on my chest. And I sat in that car not knowing what to do. I, how do you call your wife and tell her something like that? I mean, I didn't know much about glaucoma. It's not like you sat there and explained it to me. And so all I felt in that moment was just hopelessness. I felt numb. I didn't know what to do. The reality is, church, we all face dark moments in our lives. And it could be a diagnosis, it could be depression, it could be anxiety, trauma, loss. In that car, what came flooding back was this dark cloud that had wrecked my world throughout high school. And so I'm willing to bet that there are many of you here this morning who you've, you've, you've lived through many dark moments in your life or maybe you're in the middle of it right now today. But what we're gonna find in Psalm 77 is that God promises to hold you fast. So go ahead and turn with me to Psalm 77 because the question that I believe that's before us this moment is how do we respond as Christians to the dark moments that we face, whatever they might be in your life? How do we cling to hope in the middle of those moments? What does the Bible say? See, at, here at CFBC, we believe that this is the word of God. Not that it contains the word of God, but that it is his word. And so what that means is, is one of our core values at this church is that we believe that the Bible is our final source for faith and practice. We believe that God inspired over 40 authors to give us his words. And so what we're going to find in Psalm 77 is his response to depression in those dark moments that we face. See, Psalm 77 is, is a powerful poem and it, and it follows the same structure of so many psalms. When we opened our series in Psalms at the start of this summer, I, I brought us to Psalm 16, and, and, and what I was trying to impart was this idea that there is a psalm for almost every human emotion that we experience. And what's so cool is how when, when we open them, they meet us right where we are, but they do not leave us there because the psalms are, are, are built to push us consistently to trust in God, to shift our focus, and to praise him despite our circumstances. And that's what we're gonna see play out in Psalm 77. It was written by a, name, a man named Asaph, who 1 Chronicles chapter six tells us was one of the choir directors that King David set over the worship services for the tabernacle. 
And he, he wrote several of the Psalms that you'll, that you'll read in your Bible, and many of them are songs of lament. And, and God has used this passage in my life in battling my own depression. Because what you're going to find is this man, Asaph, battles serious depression in his life. And he wrote it down. And the language he uses describes exactly how I feel in one of those dark moments. And so it is my hope that God will use this moment and these words in scripture to speak to you and I about how to face the dark moments in our life. See, here's the biblical truth of responding to depression. When we face dark moments, we must shift our focus and trust in God. It's a simple statement, but it is not easy. It is the farthest thing from easy. And, and what, we, what we see in, in the opening verses is Asaph begins to cry out to God. And I want you to see this as it plays out. In verse 1, I cry aloud to God, aloud to God, and he will hear me. In the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord, and in the night, my hand is stretched out without wearying. My soul refuses to be comforted. When I remember God, I moan, and when I meditate, my spirit faints. You hold my eyelids open, and I am so troubled that I cannot speak. In these first four verses, Asaph is crying out to God, and it's not the first time. Where we find him is in the middle of his ongoing battle with depression. He's tried praying to God. He's tried meditating on God's, on God's word. What we're not told is, is what triggered his feelings in this dark moment that he finds himself in. Only that we find that he's been struggling with it for a while. And if you're a believer here in this morning, I want to make sure that, that, that this is said. If you're battling depression or anxiety or some other kind of diagnosis, you need to hear that this is not because you lack faith. The struggle and the pain that you have to endure is not because you've, you've forgotten God. See, we live in a broken world and sometimes bad things happen. The presence of sin has so corrupted God's creation that it impacts our lives in very deep and various ways. Just like in Asaph's life. We will face dark moments, but it is my prayer this morning that you and I will encounter the reality of God's word and his power in your life to face them. Look in verse two. So he cries out to God and he says, in the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord. In the night, my hand is stretched out without wearying. My soul refuses to be comforted. Look at that last line. My soul refuses to be comforted. And such an accurate depiction of how I view the very first phase of depression. And I know that medical texts have a totally different uh, phrase for it, but I call it the wallow phase. It's the initial pit that you find yourself in when you, when you enter the battle of depression. Where you, you know all the positive things to say. You might even know some Bible verses. You might have some friends and family that are checking on you, but you just want to wallow in it for a while because all those things don't change how you feel. And then, and then comes the hopeless phase, and I believe that's where we find Asaph in in verse 1. See, the hopeless phase is when you go from, from sulking to wishing you didn't feel that way anymore to wishing that the feelings would stop, that the dark moment would pass. And yet it doesn't change. And this is where Asaph is in verses three and four. He cries out to God. He says, when I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit faints. You hold my eyelids open. I'm so troubled I cannot speak. 
So he's tried praying, he's tried meditating, which is, which is us reading scripture and, and dwelling on the words and promises of God. He's tried these things, but it hasn't fixed his situation. And so here he is praying to God and expressing how he feels. He's writing out this, this prayer because words have failed him. He doesn't know how to, how to talk about it with his friends or his family. He can't speak. And so he begins to write this out. And praise God that he does because in this moment, what we're going to be able to see is how God strengthens Asaph and how he shifts his focus and begins to trust in God regardless. You and I have a front row seat to this. As he overcomes the depression in this moment, but before he gets there, He's going to bring us along. And what I think one of the first uh, tools we find in this passage is merely this. In our darkest moments, one of the most powerful tools we have is to write out exactly how we feel to God. When I preached Psalm 16, one of the first points I made is that that we need to pray. It's one of the essential elements of worship, but honest and real prayers. And so that's what's going to happen here. He says in verse 5, I consider the days of old, the years long ago. I remember my song in the night. Let me meditate in my heart. And then my spirit made a diligent search. This is the first major shift in the passage where he goes from telling us how he feels and telling God where he is and what he's experiencing. And he starts over. I'll remember my song. Let me meditate in my heart. He's tried that. What's different? The words, my spirit made a diligent search, means he's moving from the hopeless phase to the fight phase, where regardless of how he feels, he's going to fight for his hope. He's going to press into God despite the fact that his circumstance has not changed. Do not miss that. And so he's going to make a diligent search. He's going to keep fighting. He's not going to give up in this moment. See, there comes a point in the middle of our dark moments that we face where we begin to fight for our hope. For those of you in this room who have experienced some of those dark moments, you know what I'm talking about. Where you had to choose hope regardless of the fact that it didn't change how you felt in the moment. For others in this room, you're in the middle of it right now. And all I want to say is hang on and watch how this plays out in this passage. As as God begins to shift his focus, as Asaph begins to choose to shift his focus, look in verses 7 and 9. You're going to see it begin right here. He makes this diligent search, and where does he go? He begins to ask this series of questions. He says, will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favorable? Has his steadfast love forever ceased? Are his promises at an end for all time? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his compassion? What's happening right here? If we're not careful, we'll read these questions as accusative. But I believe in this moment they are instructive. See, Asaph begins to preach to himself. Now, I want to pause there, though. I've mentioned in several sermons before that our God is not offended by the believer and the humble cries of a broken heart in pain when he asks, why, God? God is not offended by your accusations. But that's not what I believe is happening here. See, he asks these series of of seemingly rhetorical questions, but the resounding answer to each one is no. Has God's steadfast love forever ceased? It's who he is. God can't be anything other than himself. Has he forgotten to be gracious? No. And so instead, he begins to remind himself of the truth of who God is, and it begins to shift his focus. That's what we see happening here. 
And that brings us to our second truth this morning. The first is that we will face dark moments. The second, though, is that we must shift our focus. He starts with these series of questions that then cause him to answer. And for, for the choir director that he, he gives this psalm to, it's to invoke or, that, 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 or elicit that response in us. Of course, God has not forgotten to be gracious. And so then he says in verse 10, I will appeal to this, to the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. Two things are happening here. In verse 10, Asaph begins to shift his focus off of the now. And this is so important for us, for those of us who, who battle perhaps anxiety or depression, who are perhaps in a, in a dark moment right here. Here's the thing about depression. It causes us to stop and look only at our moment, only at our feelings, and it eclipses everything else. How we feel is all there is, and that's all that there ever will be. See, having depression is like trying to drive with the handbrake on. It's, everything's lurching and slowing down. You feel lethargic. You lack motivation. But this is a lie. You haven't always felt like this. The world does not revolve around this moment of your pain. Your life is so much more important and valuable than what you are experiencing right now. See, it's the lie of depression that causes us to focus on ourselves and how we feel. And when we face dark moments, what God is calling Asaph to, what he's calling us to, is to shift our focus off of the now and onto the years of the right hand of the Most High to shift our focus onto the years of God's presence and action in your life. When we are overcome by the lie of the moment, we must shift our focus off of how we feel right now and begin actively remembering who God is and what he's done in our lives. Just like that old hymn, we need to begin to count our blessings one by one and for a stronger effect, write them out. Write them down. And as you begin to think through all of the ways that God has been faithful to you in the past, it will begin to shift your focus off of this immediate moment in how you feel right now. And in verses 11 and 12, he, he widens the scope. He says, I will remember the deeds of the Lord, that is his actions. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. That's God's power. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. That's his plans. This is not just the shifting off of the now, but the shifting off of ourselves. It's appealing to God's redemptive history, who he is, what he's done in the past. These three lines are so powerful. God's actions God's power and God's plan. They are the most powerful weapons as you and I face dark moments in our life. What's the weapon? God himself. Asaph shifts his focus off of himself and onto what God has done and what that proves about who God is. His actions, his power, his plans. The reason they're so powerful in our dark moments is because, hear me on this, how I feel in a moment does not change who God is. What you're facing this morning, whatever that might be, you and I, we need to shift our focus off of our situation, off of how we feel, and onto God, who he is, not who we are. Because who he is, is more than enough for what you face. We need to shift our focus. Does your life feel like it's falling apart? 
Let God be your stability. He never changes. He's always there, always present. Do you feel overcome by pain? Let him be your strength. Do you feel ashamed? Let him show you grace again. Do you feel hopeless? Remember this, he is not done with you yet. When we face dark moments, we must shift our focus and trust in God. I said it was simple, but it is not easy. We must trust in God. He continues, and you're gonna see this, this, this third major shift in the passage right here as we get to verse 13. He started with how, how he felt in the moment, where he was, and he cries out to God, and then, and then he, he moves to the fight phase, and he begins to fight for hope by remembering who God is. He begins to, to recount and think through all of the ways that God has been faithful in his past, and now we get to this moment where what he has thought about God turns to praise to God. We saw the same thing happen in Psalm 16. See, worship is so powerful because it's where you are right now, crying out to God about who he is and therefore who you are to him. We must trust in God. And so Asaph begins to write out this praise song and it is an expression of his trust in God. It takes trust to praise God in the middle of the storm. When you're at your lowest point, it takes trust to praise God. And so he begins to sing and praise him for who he is. Your way, O oh God, is holy. Verse 13, what God is great like our God. How can he say that in the moment? He's trusting. You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the peoples. With your arm, you redeemed your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph. And when the waters saw you, O oh God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. Indeed, the deep trembled, the clouds poured out water, the skies gave forth thunder, your arrows flashed on every side, the crash of your thunder was in the whirlwind, your lightnings lighted up the world, the earth trembled and shook, your way was through the sea, he says. And we're like, where is Asaph in this moment? He's remembering Israel's greatest salvific moment when God rescued his people from the Egyptians. And he led them out of Egypt after 400 years of slavery. And there they stood on the banks of the impassable Red Sea with Pharaoh and his chariots, his whole army, hot at their heels, caught, trapped, between an, an impossible task of getting across and the hopelessness that overwhelming sensation as they clutched their, their families at their sides that this was the end. See, for you and I, it's a fairy tale. That's how we view it. But for, but for those Israelites, it was very real. It happened. For Asaph, it was real. But how much more so was it real for those who were standing on the banks of the Red Sea? When the waters saw you, O oh God, when they saw you, they were afraid and the water split into two, and the walls of the water rose high, and there was a, a dry path through the water that led to the other side. Your way was through the sea. Man, if you're a Bible under, underliner or circler, you better circle verse 19. Your way was through the sea. God showed up. God made a way when there was no way. And as Asaph stares depression in the face and it seems like there is no way out, he is appealing to God's ability to save even the people from the Red Sea and the Egyptians. That's what Asaph appeals to. 
what God has done and therefore who he is and what he promises to do for us. But when I see those words, your way was through the sea, my mind goes to another miracle. In Mark chapter six, right after Jesus feeds the 5,000 plus people with a few loaves of bread, he wants to get alone with God and pray, so he sends his disciples across the Sea of Galilee. And half of his disciples were experienced fishermen. And so you can't tell me they didn't see the storm clouds brewing across the, the horizon. And Jesus is the perfect son of God. You can't tell me he didn't know what he was sending them into. And there we get to the middle of the night when they've only made it four miles off of the shore. And they're being tossed by the waves and the lightning is flashing. And what we read about in all four gospels is that the disciples were afraid for their lives. And there was Jesus. His way was through the sea. Church family, he walked on top of the water. He showed up in the middle of the disciples' darkest moment when they're afraid for their lives. The creator, God, spoke and the waters grew still. What seems impossible to us is nothing for the creator, God, who spoke and caused mountains to come into existence. What seems impossible to us is an easy thing for God. One author, C.S. Lewis, says it this way. He says, in our pleasure, God whispers, but he shouts in our pain. God showed up in the Israelites' greatest need. That's what Asaph appealed to as he sought to shift his focus and begin to trust in who God is and what he's done and therefore what he can do. But hear me, we don't appeal to the Red Sea we appeal to the greatest salvific moment in history. When Jesus Christ entered this broken world and endured the humiliation and torturous cross so that you and I could experience freedom from sin and brokenness for all eternity. That's the gospel that God made a way for us to have a relationship with him when there was no way. And I get it, you're, you're probably like me sometimes. You're sitting here this moment perhaps and you're saying, what does the gospel have to do with me facing my depression? Or this dark moment or this loss or whatever it is that you're in the middle of. How does the gospel help me right now? Oh, because it is the source of our hope and our value. Jesus did not endure the cross so that depression could have the final word over your life. He came so that you and I might have life and have it to the fullest. And through the cross, he, he made the way to answer all of evil for all of time that yes, one day we will stand before him face to face and he will wipe away every tear and all pain. Yes, but it, not only that, he provides power and strength and joy and peace right now. The gospel is your value to him. It pleases God. It pleases God to hold you fast. Hebrews 12, 2 tells us that, that, that Jesus endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. What joy? Us. His glory through us. That he would purchase for himself a people for his own possession. That we would be called sons and daughters of the Most High. And so he's provided ultimate hope through our redemption. But he gives us the Holy Spirit of the living God. The same spirit that rose Jesus Christ from the dead. You want to talk about impossible. The same spirit of God that hovered over the waters in the Red Sea split. The same spirit of God that is in you and me who believe. To face whatever it is that comes our way. It's not the fruit of your experience that produces joy and peace. It is the fruit of the spirit. 
I know that perhaps where you are right now, you don't feel peaceful. God doesn't expect you to. He promises to bring peace that surpasses understanding, Philippians 4. This is God's work, God's promise. He will hold you fast. Church, you will face dark moments. But when we do, we must shift our focus off of the now, off of how we feel in this moment, off of ourselves and onto who God is, what he's done, what he's promised, what he's doing. And trust in God. Simple, not easy. You and I have to fight for that to remind ourselves over and over again when our feelings don't change, to continue to rest that this is true. I remember sitting in my car after that diagnosis, unable to call Melinda, not sure what I would say. I didn't know much about glaucoma. Not in that moment. I knew that my permanent nerve damage in my right eye would supposedly only get worse and that it was in both my eyes. And as that weight that was so real to me in that moment, it's as if my blood just you know, drew from my face and I felt cold and, I, and I, at first I couldn't think anything and then all the thoughts start racing. Y'all know what I'm talking about? We were just overwhelmed by all the possibilities and the situations. And, and all, I can, all I can thank God for really, I mean, there's two things. Number one, for whatever reason, I did not wallow in it for the first time in years. And secondly, that one question began to eclipse my thoughts. What what does this mean for me now? What am I going to do? And the Holy Spirit of God just began to drive me to Scripture. And the only answer that I had was that I would serve you with one eye. If that's what it means, what I face does not change my purpose. What you and I have to go through in a moment or a lifetime does not change our purpose. 2 Corinthians 5, 9 is so powerful in counseling because it shifts our focus off of ourselves and onto our purpose in God. In 2 Corinthians 5, 9, it says this, we make it our aim to please him. To please him, how? How can I please him in my depression or in my diagnosis or in my anxiety or or this other thing that I have to go, how? By how you and I respond, by the things we say, by what we do, how we think, to please him. It does not change our purpose. We are to glorify God by pleasing him. Turn to Hebrews 11, verse six. How do I please God? God's word is our final source of faith and practice. God's word doesn't leave us without an answer. In verse six of Hebrews chapter 11, it says, and without faith, it is impossible. How can I please God in my depression? It's impossible without faith. It sounds crazy to a lost and dying world. How can you face the loss of a loved one? Faith, hope, in what is true. Without faith, it is impossible to please God for whoever would draw near to God must believe he exists. This is the part that we get. Here's the one easy. That regardless of what I go through, God is still true. It's the one easy. You ready for the hard? And that he rewards those who diligently seek him. Without faith, it is impossible to please God for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. Now, someone might ask, what's my reward? Where is my reward in all of this? Is he gonna take away these feelings? Is he gonna gonna fix me? 
Can we pause for a second? He could. Let me say that again. He could. He can. But even if you and I have to live with the consequences of someone else's actions or a diagnosis or chronic pain for the rest of our lives, your purpose does not change. Who God is remains the same and he rewards those who diligently seek him. That means he's after your joy. God wants your joy regardless of the circumstance and it's not your fruit, it's his. He produces the joy and the peace and the patience in our lives. And God gives peace and strength and joy to us now for the things that we face and he provides eternity as the ultimate answer for evil. When we face dark moments, we must shift our focus and trust in God. Right now, we're gonna move into a time of response. We're gonna worship God together regardless of where you find yourself this morning. We can praise God. I'm gonna ask the worship team to join me on stage. Our, our staff, our team is gonna be down front. And this is a time for us to respond. I want you right now, I'm gonna pray in a moment and then we're gonna begin to sing and we're gonna begin, begin to respond. Read back through. Maybe you're in verse two, my soul refuses to be comforted. Maybe you're asking these questions, God, have you forgotten to be gracious? Regardless, the answer is the same. Shift your focus off of the now and how you feel, off of yourself and begin to, to remember God, who he is and what he's done and what he's promised and trust him, trust him. Real trust is clinging to God's truth and promises regardless of the circumstances. It doesn't take trust to go to an amusement park, to do your job or go to dinner. It takes real trust when the doctor gives you the diagnosis, when you're fired from your job, when, you're, when your kid leaves, when your spouse leaves. It takes real trust to believe God's word that he is good and that he is working even now. If you would like to have a relationship with Jesus Christ because you want the same spirit of God inside you, if you recognize that you've tried it all the best you can and that your sin, who you are, will never be good enough, you don't have to worry anymore. Jesus Christ already was. And he offers you grace, forgiveness, and eternal life forever. Come to one of our team members down front and tell them that you want to know Jesus. If you're in a dark moment right now though, and what you need is prayer, come. Cry out to God. Ask one of our team to pray for you. We would love to do that. Or if you'd like to join a church of imperfect people seeking to trust God no matter the circumstances, come. However the Holy Spirit leads, would you stand as I pray and then respond to God. In the name of the true Lord Jesus Christ, would you move in power in this moment? Would you shatter our feelings? That it's not about how we feel or what we face regardless of how impossible it might seem or how unending the pain might be. It doesn't change who you are and what our purpose is. God, help us to please you even now. And God, bring peace and joy and strength and love. Restore, redeem as you have promised to do. God, we trust you in Jesus' name.